Sounds good. Yep. Well, everyone, it's my absolute thrill to welcome the machine, Mark Sisson, to the Storybox <laughs> podcast today. Mark is an American fitness author, a New York Times bestseller, I should say. He's a food blogger and former long distance runner, tri triathlete, and Ironman competitor. He's incredible. Mark is the founder of Primal Kitchen Food, the ever popular Mark's Daily Apple, the Primal Blueprint, and Primal Health Coach. Uh, Mark, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the Storybox podcast. Hey, it's my pleasure being here. Thank you so much for, for taking out the time uh, to speak to me. I can't wait to actually unbox your story today. But before we do that, I usually have one question that I ask all my guests at the start, which is, what does success look like to you? Well, I mean, success looks to me, because I've, I've had all manner of success in my life, it's really weird because, you know, I've, I feel like I've had um, several different lives. You know, I was, a, I was a lead athlete, and so success to me was I finished fifth in the U.S. National Championships. I qualified for Olympic trials and marathon in 1980. Uh, I, I ran a time that had been the world record when I was born. So I had a successful career, let's say, uh, as a runner, and then I got injured. And had I never done anything else, I would have been able to say, you know, I had some, I had a modicum of success. Uh, but then I moved on to triathlon, and I finished fourth at Ironman, and I, I, I wound up becoming uh, Secretary General of the International Triathlon Union, one of the, you know, the, the, the World Federation, and I was in charge of the anti-doping program, and I helped get triathlon in the Olympic Games. So you could say I had a tre tremendous amount of success there, enough to rest on my laurels and, and stop. Um, I had a successful vitamin company for 20 years and was enough to retire on. In fact, I considered retiring when I was in my 50s and just playing golf and, you know, and, and paddle boarding and doing stuff like that. But, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. So you can say I had some success there. And then when I was 61, I decided I would start a food company. Uh, and I sold the food company two years ago um, when I was 65. So, you know, that was a very successful venture. Now, how do I su define success? I define it as, you know, do I wake up every morning and feel strong and confident and happy and productive and ready to make a contribution to the world? That's really at the end, at the end of all of these different, you know, metrics that we might use to define success. It really, it, it really comes down to how do I define success for myself and how do I get myself out of bed? Why do I want to get out of bed every day and tackle whatever it is I have to do? That's really, I think, the true measure of success for me. Have you ever had those days where you know you struggle to actually get up? And if you do have those days, which I'm pretty sure everyone does, but when you do have those days, what do you normally do? Like what's your routine to get out of that mindset that that being stuck? All right. So um, I, I told a friend of this. Uh, a, a while ago, and uh, I've said it a couple of times in uh, in uh, polite conversation, but I'll, it's a little bit too much information, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Okay. So, so, like, I typically have no problem getting out of bed. I'm not someone who just like pulls the covers over my head and say, oh, I can't face the day. I got too much crap going on. You know, uh, I'm, I like the challenge of the problem. So I'm, I get out of bed and, uh, you know, I get a cup of coffee going first thing. So I, I get the, creative juices flowing and, and whatnot. But, but my thing, my mantra is, um, as I'm uh, taking my morning leak, I'm <laughs> looking out the window and I'm going, you know, if, if I stopped everything today and just said, you know what, I'm done, um, I'd be okay with that. You know, again, we talked about what success looks like. I would be okay with everything that I've accomplished in all of my life and all, you know, I have great children. I have grandchildren now. Um, I have great friends. If I stopped today and just, you know, kicked it in and just said, that's enough. I'm done. It's been a great run, but I'm going to stop right now. I would be okay with that. But nah, let's get up and go. Let's go to work. You know, so that's my, that's sort of my little process. I have a, my own mantra, my own philosophy, because I'm very much the same way as you. I get up at 4 a.m. every single morning. I'm a morning person. I hate the nighttime because that's my time to sleep and rest my brain. But I get up at 4 a.m. because I have a philosophy in life that if I can beat the sun, that no matter what comes my way during the day, I can beat that too. So I'm like, embrace the challenge, embrace the pain, embrace all that stuff, and yeah. just enjoy it because life is, is there to enjoy because you only got one yeah. of them. So make the most of it. So I really appreciate you saying that, man. We're kindred spirits in that, in that. <laughs> good. Um, I, I usually 
I want to ask you, uh, Mark, of all the things that you've done, what would you say has been the most challenging? Uh, let's see. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like raising kids. I mean, I think raising kids is, is the most challenging of all the things I've done because everything else I've, I've done, sometimes I fail. I mean, I've failed literally more often, many, many times more often than I've succeeded. And it was okay if I failed, right? It was, it was, the challenge was the challenge. I embraced it. I had my goals. I had my, you know, intention, but I released my attachment to the outcome in every one of those situations. And sometimes it worked great and sometimes it worked okay. And sometimes it failed miserably. You can't do that with kids. So kids to me, raising kids was the big, was the big challenge. And as a business person who's, as an entrepreneur, who's, who, you know, who's trying to grind it out, uh, not just, you know, I always had like several things going at the same time in terms of business. Um, I, I made certain that I would spend quality time with my kids and give them the, the life that, that they deserved as children. Um, partly because if, if you do the analysis and go, well, like, why am I doing all this stuff? Why am I trying to build this empire? Why am I trying to you know, create these new products? Why am I tr trying to uh, get these new services accepted by the world? Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's so I can feel good about feeding my family and taking care of them. And so if I can't take care of them in real time while they're, you know, needing my attention, it seems uh, a bit of a, a mismatch. So that, that's always been a, the biggest challenge. And, and again, I have great, I have two great kids. Uh, they let me know that they really appreciate, uh, you know, what I did in, in raising them and my wife and I together, uh, in the time we spent. Um, so that was, you know, that, that had a huge, uh, return on investment. If you would do the analysis that way, mm -hmm. everything else in terms of most challenging, I can tell you about, you know, horror stories of business deals gone bad and sleepless nights and, uh, but you know, you get over that stuff, that, that, that stuff you move on from that stuff and you go to the next thing. Mm. Business is business. Family yeah. is family. But when yeah. you impact family, it leaves a lasting impact, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, Mark, you've had all this success, both in family with running with or athletics with business too. I'm curious about what did, what have you noticed or what do you believe makes a real man? Uh, wow. Uh, what makes a real man? Um, I think it's just being, being true yourself, uh, knowing, you know, who you are, uh, being aware of your shortcomings, um, being, uh, you know, proud of your accomplishments, uh, take, like, taking care of those around you. I mean, I think, you know, the, I'm, I'm a, uh, a leader in the ancestral health movement. And if you look at the ancestral health movement, it, harks back to millions of years ago when we were, you know, evolving as a species and how the, the, um, you know, how the division of labor within tribes and how the, the males were, you know, sort of the leaders of, of, of most tribes and the responsibilities of the male to, to feed and uh, protect uh, that doesn't go away. So I, I, I really do think that that's the, the measure of a true man is, is how you treat your family. And if you're somebody who doesn't have children, but you have, you still have, you know, siblings or parents or cousins or whatever, it's still important to, um, to make sure that you, um, look out for them and, and, uh, make, and see that they're, they're, that they're well taken care of within the context of what you are able to provide. Mm, that's a good answer. I want to dive back a little bit to how you grew up, Mark, and what you actually wanted to be when you grew up and how you actually got started in running were you always interested in running or what how did that come about uh no so i grew up in a small fishing village in maine uh i i was you know you know i didn't i didn't want to be a fisherman uh my father was a painter he was an artist a fine artist and he literally supported the family selling paintings it was a tough a tough life um because that's it was it was always been tough being an artist a starving artist but but i i um i was a smart kid in this kind of rural area of maine um, I was the nerdy kid. I got, you know, bullied and kind of beat up on. Uh, so I was never really athletic in the sense of uh, playing soccer, football, baseball, uh, footy, 
you know, any of the, any of the other, um, more, you know, hockey, which is big in, in New England. Uh, and because I lived a mile and a half from school, I just jogged to and from school every day just to kind of get home or get to school quicker and not have to, you know, what, not have to wait around. Um, and I could beat the bus actually in most cases. So I, I was fit enough after a couple of years of, of running a mile and a half each way every day to school that when I went out for the track team, even though I was a freshman in high school and again was a, kind of a small, skinny uh, guy with not a lot of muscle tone, um, I was able to win the mile, the two mile uh, in most of the track meets that we that we had. And I got a lot of cred, street cred for that from the guys who, who used to be bullying me. Uh, and over the years, that um, that uh, strength that I had in terms of endurance served me well. Uh, I became the cat. I went then. I went to a private uh, a prep school, uh, preparatory school for a couple of years. I was captain of the cross country and track team there, and then I went to college and I was captain of the track team there. And then so everything sort of uh, as as I discovered that little uh, superpower that I had, the ability to, to <laughs> the ability to manage discomfort, which is really what endurance athletics is all about. Mm -hmm. Um, that became kind of a nice little, uh, basis for not just my competitive career, but also my business career withstanding discomfort and withstanding pain became kind of a nice little, uh, you know, having practiced that for so long and applying it across, uh, all of the efforts that I was making, whether they were physical efforts or mental efforts, mm -hmm. uh, served me quite well. So how does someone actually, you speak about running and endurance running, how painful it actually is. Now I'm an endurance runner too. And I know that when you get past that, that mental block, like it, it, but it's actually hard to actually get past that mental block. So what are some things that you actually do to, as you are running, coping through the pain, how do you cope with it? Like, how do you move past it? There have always been sort of two theories about um, about running, and you know, and and when we talk about pain, um, I think that's that's the wrong term, which is why I like to use the term discomfort because um, it doesn't. It's not you know, stabbing, jarring pain. Sometimes it is, but for the most part, it's just uncomfortable. You're just pushing your body to the brink of um, you know oxygen debt, where your brain is kind of screaming at you to slow down or pull over the side of the road and take a nap, and here you are willfully forcing yourself to continue uh, at a high pace. Um, and so early on, I realized there were two types of people who, uh, who became, you know, gr uh, great runners. There were the dissociators. And I was, I think typically I was a dissociator and a dissociator was someone who, who went into a hole and, and got into a zone in the race and was sort of like, wasn't aware so much of the immediate surroundings in the real time. But over time, like I would build, I would design and build a house in my thoughts uh, during a marathon. Uh, and that was my dissociation. Then there are those who are associators and they associate with the discomfort and they're always monitoring, you know, how's my right leg? How's, how's that hip tendonitis? How's my, uh, you know, I'm, I, I feel like I'm brushing my right arm across the front of me a little bit more than I should. How's my breathing? Um, and, and those are the people who, um, and by the way, those are the people I think tend to be the most successful uh, because they're, they're acknowledging the situation and they're, they're um, identifying in real time what they need to do uh, to keep up with it. And I've, I've been on both sides. I mean, I've, I've been in the association side where, you know, you get in a marathon and, and the pace is usually uh, it's, it's, you know, right from the start. It's, 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 if you're running, you know, five minute miles, it's pretty, it's pretty intense right from the start. You know, you, you almost get out of breath in the first half mile. You have to kind of settle down and, and actually get that, that second wind. Uh, and I used to have these um, moments in races. Uh, I would call them crisis moments. And, you know, you're 10 or 15 miles into a race and you start to feel uh, that a greater degree of discomfort. It might be a, a, a stitch or a stomach ache or, a, you know, something going on. And, and the only way to resurrect the race is to pick up the pace, not to slow down and back off. And because if you slow down and back off, now you've lost the pack. Now you're, you know, again, this is at the, at the highest level of competition. If you lose the pack in a marathon, you almost never come back. Yeah. So the only way around that is to decide as bad as I feel, I need to pick up the pace five seconds a mile right now mm -hmm. and see if I can jolt it and, 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 and somehow shock my system into that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, right? I mean, um, and I would allow myself 
to maybe three of those crises in any event. And if it got to more than three, I'm like, all right, this, mm. I, I've read the, this is not my day. You know, this is, and again, as an endurance athlete, and, and the, the, the analogy to business is very similar. Um, you know, but as, as an endurance athlete, you're well-trained. Uh, everybody who toes the line that day to start that race uh, is pretty well, you know, they're pretty well-trained. They're pretty fit. They've got the VO2 max numbers. They've got all the things, you know, and what is it that, that, that day has the one guy emerging from the pack as the winner, you know, and it's typically that he felt or she felt that day, like, this is my day. I'm in control of the situation. I can manage the discomfort. Uh, I can get through the crises without caving. Uh, and, and it's that, um, it's that mindset that ultimately determines those guys who, who set world records and win gold medals. Mm. You look at like David Goggins, someone like that. Yeah. Yeah. He's an absolute animal when it comes to running. He just goes and gets it done or Chad Wright. Yeah. Well, uh, the Navy SEAL, um, I saw a video of his, he was like doing this really, really tough challenge. And I think it was Jesse Itzler asked him, so how are you going? And then he's just like getting it done, just getting it done. Yeah. You go, yeah, go out there and, and perform. And yeah. I was like, his attitude during the whole thing, he was smiling during the whole thing. And I'm yeah. like, what the heck? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. just an incredible mindset. Now, for those people that don't know, am I able to ask how old you are? Because when people see photos of you, you, you look like an absolute beast. Yeah, I'm 67. 67. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's weird. I, I feel really fit these days. Um, I was just uh, during, during COVID, I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. And so I went on a road trip this year and I figured out some of the, the, uh, entry and exit strategies for different countries. So I was in the Bahamas for a while. I was in Turkey for a while. I was in French, South of France for six months, six, sorry, six weeks. And, um, and the whole time I was there, I was stuck to my routine and I was eating well, but I've lost, I lost like five pounds, uh, this during this season. And I go to the gym today and I'm not, I don't need to brag, but people say, you look like you've gained weight. I'm like, well, or, you know, you look ripped. And I'm like, no, I've, I've, I've actually lost weight, but it must be I've lost body fat. Hey, dude, I was never, I was never somebody who you would ever say had, had body fat, but I guess I lost more body fat during this thing. So um, more testament to just how important the dietary aspect of all this is, right? I mean, diet drives your, your body composition more than anything else. So the fact that I couldn't lift weights, you know, and maintain muscle mass wasn't that germane to my um, keeping my, you know, my level, my fitness level up and, and everything else while I was on this amazing three, three month holiday. I want to get to the, the diet aspect in a moment, which is uh, I'm quite fascinated by this primal uh, kitchen uh, yeah. and the primal diet, which I, I, I absolutely love. Um, but I want to ask you, why do you run and do you still run today? Yeah. So I don't run at all now. Uh, I haven't run a, so I haven't run a mile in 20 years, maybe 25 years. I haven't run a mile in 25 years, and 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 it goes back to what we were just discussing, which is the mindset that it takes to be an elite endurance athlete is almost a sickness. It's it's such a investment in a headspace that is difficult to access from the beginning, and then becomes uh, becomes an obsession. Right. So if you're a runner, you know that that any day you don't run, you sort of beat yourself up and you're guilty for, for this. And I ran 100 miles a week for seven years, you know, so so I didn't take many days off. And, you know, to just be able to go out and say, I'm going to run 15 today and then tomorrow I'm going to run 20 hard. And then the next day I'm going to I'm going to the track and do 12 miles of you know mile repeats. Um, you have to have a very specific, almost sociopathic, uh, level of, uh, masochism to do that. And yes, there's some, uh, some aspect of endorphins, you know, it's sort of the natural painkillers and the, and when those kick in, but my point is over the years of, of endurance training, 25 years of endurance training, when I decided to stop, I lost my mojo. What can I say? I lost that ability to, um, to, uh, to extract any sort of um, benefit at all 
forget pleasure. I just couldn't extract any benefit from the concept of going for a mile run. And so I realized a bunch of years, I said, look, I, I had this great time as an endurance athlete. I rode, I, I was a great bike rider. I was almost a better bike rider than I was a, a runner at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I had a, a great run at that. But um, I realized in over 200 endurance competitions, there was never a time in a race ever when I could say, wow, this is fun. And yet the games, you know, we know all the guys that are playing, um, you know, uh, soccer and, and uh, you know, football and, and, uh, and hockey and, and basketball and all the other baseball, all the games that, that in the different countries that we, that we live in, those guys are having fun. They're getting paid a crap load of money and they're having fun, you know, and it might be tense at times. They might have to, you know, hunker down and, and, and work hard, but they're always having fun. And I never really could say that about my endeavors. So I switched my little mindset a bunch of years ago and I said, I'm only going to work out if it's going to be fun. So I do uh, a bunch of stand up paddling. I, I'll go for an hour and a half on the stand up paddle. I went, I'm, I'm looking out my window. I'm in Miami right now. I went out. Jark. I saw um, eight foot tarpon. I saw um, hammerhead sharks. It was incredible. I saw dolphins. Um, and I'm getting an amazing workout. I'm having fun doing it. Mm. Uh, if any of your listeners or viewers have seen the game, Ultimate Frisbee. I play Ultimate Frisbee at least once a week. It's that's two hours in my case, two hours of sprinting and stopping and changing direction and sprinting and jumping and, and running. It's like being a kid again. Mm. Um, I have a fat bike, a, a, you know, this big four and a half inch wide tires and I ride it up and down the sand. I ride 10 miles on the sand uh, here in Miami. And, um, and it's, and it's fun for me cause I'm out in the sun and, and it, I, it's not, it's a great workout, but there's no hills and, uh, I can pull over whenever I want and stop. I don't have to, you know, and, and the likelihood of crashing because I, there's no, you're not crashing like you would maybe on a mountain bike. So I've sort of orchestrated all of my, uh, activities around, um, you know, how can I have fun now? How can I do something that's enjoyable that isn't contemplated to, uh, to have me, um, struggling and suffering. I spent two, three, um, sessions in the gym every week. But for me, the gym is more like a social hour. I get to, I get to hang out with people there. I get to, even during COVID, we're wearing our masks, but I'm talking to people. They allow 12 people in the gym at a time where I am right now. So I've made it very, um, you know, again, it's been, it's been part of my, uh, my life process to make sure that I'm taking care of myself and my mental health by not beating myself up needlessly when I'm working out. Hence the no, the no running. And no running means it's better for your knees too. So, <laughs> yeah. So you know, when I when I raced marathons, I was at one thirty eight, one forty, one hundred and thirty eight pounds, one hundred and forty one pounds, and then I raced triathlons because I was a little bit bigger uh, because of my cycling legs and at like one fifty one, and I, I weigh one seventy now. So I literally weigh thirty pounds more now at the same body fat than when I was a runner. And so, if you can imagine my my old runner brain going dude, you have a 30 pound backpack on. Why are you even trying to run distance? So I can, you know, I can sprint like crazy. In fact, my, my mind in, in my mind, a legend in my own mind at 67, I can sprint faster than when I was a, a elite marathoner. Um, if I'm sprinting across the grass to catch a Frisbee or something like that. So um, it, again, it's all about having fun and it's, and it is about not getting injured. So that, that part about protecting the knees, I don't need to run just for the sake of running. And now I want to get into this very interesting uh, line of line of thought, Mark. Now I want to get into the sort of dietary part of things. You've you've got this this blog, Mark's Daily Apple. I want to ask you first how that actually came about, and then I want to dive into the the primal stuff. Sure. So I've always been creating content. Um, I wrote my first book, uh, Training and Racing. Uh, it was a Runner's World Triathlon Training Book in 1981. It was one of the first books, if not the first book, on training for triathlons. And I wrote a book called Training and Racing Biathlons, and I wrote some stuff for the general population on how to lose weight. Uh, so I've always been pretty good at creating content. Um, and then I started this vitamin company, this supplement company, uh, in 96. And I started selling I, – I would go on television. I would be a guest on – uh, on health shows, health talk shows. And I would talk about diet and exercise and fitness and medicine and whatever else. 
And oh, by the way, I had these wonderful supplements that you might want to try. And I, I grew a very successful business doing that. Uh, however, over the years, the business model that had worked so well in the early years started to shift, started to dry up. The internet was coming on, people were buying online. Uh, there were now in the US 300 television channels you could watch. So the likelihood of somebody seeing me on one of my shows was less and less. Mm. Um, and so in 2006, I just said, you know, I'm going to try my hand at this blogging thing. It sounds like an interesting uh, approach. And I'm again, I'm pretty prolific at creating content. I can write something every day, hence Mark's Daily Apple. Uh, so we started in September of 2006, and it has it grew uh, pretty rapidly and pretty steadily because it was really one of the few voices of alternative medicine, alternative health that, that looked at my two favorite things, which are evolution, uh, anthropology and evolution, and modern genetic science. How does the body, how, how does the body respond to the inputs from food, from sleep, from play, from lifting weights? What are the methods by which gene expression happens? How are the genes turned on that build muscle, burn fat, create a, a, a healthy immune system, keep us from being diabetic? So I really, I, I really delved into that whole topic of how can we, no matter what level of health you have currently, whether you're an athlete or whether you're a, uh, an average Joe or Jill, uh, how can you achieve optimal health by understanding how the body works and understanding the concept of evolution and understanding the concept of gene expression and epigenetics and how epigenetics, which is the level of control of, above the genes, it, it flips the switches that turns the gene on and off, make the proteins, et cetera, et cetera. So it became... Uh, you know, my, my mission was to initially to change uh, the health of 10 million people by helping them understand how their body works and getting them off this medical, you know, uh, conveyor belt that they that they seem to be on. Uh, and it, and it, it took off and it was it was quite successful. And then I wrote a book called The Primal Blueprint because enough people had seen my blog and said, I, I read your blog every day. Can you put it all together in one comprehensive book? Hence, hence the book. Mm. I'm curious, what do you think is having done all this research, having done all this like epigenetics and diving into all that, which I'm fascinated by too, what have you noticed? Because we're all different as human beings. So what have you noticed is optimal health? I, again, it's almost like, you know, defining success. Optimal health is different for different people. Some people, you know, have a, um, you know, a, a set of family genes that sort of, didn't, didn't doom them from the start, but made it much more important that they pay attention to uh, every critical factor of diet and exercise, whereas other people can get away with a lot of, you know, uh, 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 sort of tangential, edgy sort of things. Um, so optimal health is basically, um, you could start by saying it's, it's freedom from disease. You're, you, have, you don't have any, you know, notable disease. You could also say that it's um, a condition where you have uh, an ideal body composition that allows you to not just look good naked, but to move well through space and to, uh, and to be able to perform uh, whether the tasks, whether they're tasks at work or, or family tasks or, or you know, fun things that you're doing that allows you to perform well. Um, boundless energy. I mean, do you have enough energy when you wake up in the morning to get you through the day without having to take a nap? Do you, um, are you able to be, um, so, you know, with that statement, I would say that one of the things that defines optimal health is what I call achieving metabolic flexibility, right? So metabolic flexibility means you can get through the day burning whatever fuel substrate happens to be handy. So if you have excess body fat, you've taught your body how to take that fat out of storage and combust it. If you have glucose because you just had something with sugar or something with carbohydrate, you can burn that and not suffer Ill, Ill consequences with a huge swing in your insulin. Um, and, and this metabolic flexibility is what uh, allows people to reduce inflammation because they don't, they're not constantly uh, taking in High carb foods that are or or, or offending foods that, that cause a rise in systemic inflammation. The foods they're consuming are um, providing substrate for energy and uh, building blocks for uh, muscles and bones and and neurotransmitters and and everything else that we need. 
while, and, and by the way, these, these, my number one rule is that all of these foods have to taste great. So, so one of the things I do is I create a list of, you know, the foods that I think are, are ideal for consumption. And, uh, and they, I think they all, they, you know, they taste great. They're natural. They're available to everyone. They're not that exclusive. And as long as you um, eliminate the industrial seed oils, the cotton seed oil, the soybean oil, the corn oil, the, the canola oil, uh, which are very offensive, as long as you eliminate the sugars and the added sugars, the sweetened beverages, the, the, the desserts, the pies, the cakes, the candies, the cookies, and oh. the, bis the biscuits, uh, as you say. And uh, um, I know, but you know, that I don't mean necessarily eliminate them forever, but you know, as long as they're not part of your regular oh. intake. I mean, I, yeah, I went to dinner last night and I had, I had some dessert and it's like, I'm not apologizing for it. It was great. But I had three bites. I didn't have three pieces, right? So, um, but those, if you get rid of those uh, offending foods, uh, the sugars, uh, again, the the, uh, the industrial seed oils, um, and for a lot of people, getting rid of grains. So, getting rid of wheat primarily, because wheat is a uh, is an insidious problem for a lot of people who assume they can consume wheat without uh, without any sort of uh, negative effects, and it's and it's probably not accurate. So you say, Jay, you're going to say, well, what, well, what can I eat, man? Well, you know, you, uh, beef, pork, lamb, chicken, fish, turkey, um, eggs, uh, you know, all the vegetables you ever want, um, uh, you boring, know, potatoes, though, potatoes. Yeah. And then, and, and, and that list, which is a fairly finite list, uh, once, I, once I realized that those were the main foods that people should be eating on a regular basis, real, natural food. Um, my aha moment came with my company, with Primal Kitchen, when I realized, wow, it's, yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a, a short list, but the sauces, the dressings, the toppings, the methods of preparation, the herbs, the spices, that's what gives all of these things such great variety that you continue to eat them, uh, you know, forever and never get tired of it and always have some novel dining experience. That's the reason there are like a thousand paleo and primal and keto cookbooks because there's infinite ways to fix these amazing foods and, and render them healthy, not just remove the unhealthy ingredients, but impart uh, functionality to, to some of these foods. So when I created Primal Kitchen, it was with that specific intent to put to make the kind of, for instance, the kind of salad dressings you could put on a otherwise bland you know, assortment of what, eight or nine vegetables. But, but by dousing it with a, a dressing, uh, one day it's a, a Caesar, another day it's a vinaigrette, you know, another day it's a Russian. I mean, you can change the taste profile every single day on that same collection of vegetables and have a different experience and have it be something that you look forward to, not something that you dread. Mm. Uh, and, and so we've created, you know, a mayonnaise that, is based on avocado oil and organic uh, cage-free eggs. So it's a very good for you mayonnaise. And what it did was it allowed people who realized that the old version of mayonnaise that, that everyone was used to, at least in the United States, was so full of cottonseed oil and corn oil that it was horrible. They, they, they had stopped eating a long time ago. Now they can eat mayonnaise again, and now they can make tuna salad and chicken salad and potato salad and and you know all of the different slaws and things that they thought they couldn't eat again. So my business, my Primal Kitchen food business, grew up looking for opportunities to to add flavor and variety to all of the, for all those people who wanted to stay as healthy as they possibly could and eat as clean as they could, but were uh, frustrated at the lack of offerings that they found in the supermarket. Mm. So. Because there are so many diets out there, like you mentioned, there's a lot of paleo and all that keto diets and everything like that. Um, I'm curious, why should somebody go on the primal diet? Like what's, what are the benefits? Well, I mean, the benefits are um, you will trend toward your ideal body composition. So you start to become a better fat burner uh, by eliminating a lot of the, the foods that we eliminate on this program. Um, you'll have more energy throughout the day. Uh, you'll probably sleep better. Uh, you'll probably be more productive at work and won't feel like, um, 
you've got these wild energy swings throughout the day where your, you know, your, your blood sugar is, is, uh, taking a hit from the meal that you just ate and then, and, and dousing your body with insulin and then causing you to be hungry again for the next meal. So all these things tend to be mitigated and, and the, the primal blueprint is, is very doable for everyone because we don't even eliminate uh, nearly as many foods as say the keto diet would eliminate. Oh, yeah. Keto diet beca it becomes uh, a more restrictive diet in some regards, but the keto diet also really, really dials in your metabolic flexibility. So most people, for instance, who are keto uh, only eat two meals a day because three meals a day is just too much food. They can't, they can't do it because their body is so good at burning off their stored body fat, so good at producing ketones, so good at, and so efficient at um, using the energy that's available within their body and not having to um, to um, to burn it and throw off a bunch of free radicals and, and create a lot of, of toxic uh, byproduct in the process, they become so efficient that they don't need as much food to, to thrive. And that's the big, um, I think the biggest, uh, most, most relevant benefit of a keto diet is, that is achieving metabolic flexibility and realizing you don't need nearly as much food as you think to maintain muscle mass, to be strong, to not get sick, to have all the energy you want, and most importantly, to not be hungry, because hunger just ruins everything, right? But if you become metabolically flexible, your body doesn't even know that the 500 calories that it just consumed in the form of fat, it doesn't know whether it came off your hips and thighs or whether it came off a plate of food that you just ate, because you're... The, the, the process by which you you recognize the need for for energy and the body deals with it in the re, in real time by taking the fat out of storage is a seamless process that you don't have to think about you don't have to wonder about and the body does it because you've trained it to do it mm. what would you say mark has been the weirdest food combination you've ever tried uh, <laughs> well um, the, the weirdest food combination um, Years ago, uh, before I was married, I had a girlfriend who was a uh, vegan and uh, <laughs> vegetarian. And uh, there was a great, um, a great skater, uh, ice skater, Eric Hyden. I don't know if you remember Eric Hyden, but he won five gold medals in one of the Olympics. And then he, then he became a cyclist and, and, and raced for uh, the 7-Eleven team. So I used to train with him in the old days. And he came over to the house with his girlfriend one night. And my girlfriend made this. Uh, amazing sort of uh, gorgonzola fettuccine dish and uh, she realized we didn't have any cream and she was she was sort of vegan and she didn't want to so she went down to the convenience store and she bought fake creamer she bought like a, a, a sucrose based creamer and so when she put that with the with the gorgonzola and the, and the fettuccine um, um, it all sort of all of the stuff boiled off and it was basically if you can imagine gorgonzola and sugar and pasta. Um, and it was horrible. And I was, I was mortified, but anyway, I was, I just, I, just, I hadn't thought about that for a long time, but that was like, that was a pretty weird, uh, food combination. Otherwise, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of okra for instance, uh, which is a, you know, a, a vegetable we have in the U S here. It's too slimy for me. And, mm -hmm. Um, uh, but no, for the most part, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I trust, the, the chef that I'm with to prepare something that I'm going to enjoy. Sugar pasta. That sounds very interesting. Sugar pasta, yeah. <laughs> well, gorgonzola, you know, blue cheese and sugar too. I mean, that was, um, no yeah. way. Blue cheese in of itself is disgusting. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Those yeah. People like it, but I can't stand it. Yesterday, yeah. Mark, I did something very interesting. I had, I don't know if you have yo pro yogurt over there, but I was having, I just, I was doing something very, I shouldn't have been doing it, but anyway, I had um, natural confectionery lollies and I had the yogurt and I just, you know, I didn't want to finish the lollies before I took a spoonful of the yogurt. So I put the yogurt in my mouth and it actually worked. It tasted really good. And I was like, yeah. this, is, this is like a genius idea. they like the lolly yeah. flavor for yogurt. <laughs> oh, yeah. maybe, maybe someone listening to this might use that. But anyway. I'm um, sure several people will. I want to yeah. guarantee it. Yeah. <laughs> but Mark, I have uh, a couple more questions for you, if you don't mind. There's so much we could unpack about your story, which we have to make another time, uh, maybe later on. But what has been the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Well, I mean, I think the worst piece of advice, which I see a lot now out in the, um, 
uh, in the Instagram and social social coaching space. There's, you know, everybody on Instagram is a coach, a business coach, right? Yeah. And the advice is you just have to work harder. You know, you just have to work harder. Um, you're not doing it enough. Uh, and very few people say you're not doing it right. Or very few, few people say, no, you're just, you know, you're, if, if you're not successful, it's because you're not working hard enough. And uh, I learned a long time ago that that's, that's the worst piece of advice you could give someone. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 you know, obviously we hear, we hear the other side of that, which is work, work smarter, not harder. And that's, a bit of a bit of a palliative. That's a bit of a um, you know watered down version because there's there are nuances to that as well. But uh, anybody who says, "Hey, man, you're not working hard enough," for the most part, they don't understand what it is you're trying to accomplish. So, having said that, what would you what would advice would you give to somebody that actually wants to achieve something great in their own life? Uh, well, the first piece of advice is um, you know have always have an idea and a goal and something that you're working on and chasing, um, but release attachment to the outcome of that goal. And it's a, it's, it, it sounds a little weird to say that, but absolutely you have the goal, absolutely grow, you know, do what you need to do to make things happen. But, but in the event that things don't exactly turn out as your business plan pro, you know, projected 18 months in, be in a position to pivot and be in a position to be open to new ways of doing things, new ideas, new, um, you know, new, 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 new uh, products that you hadn't thought of that weren't part of your product line or new services or a new application for your, you know, for whatever uh, app you're building. Be uh, open and receptive to the concept that, your original idea was probably pretty good, but maybe it can be better if you just uh, attune your awareness and don't grind so strictly to the business plan that you that you initially set up. Mm, I, I, I don't that. know if that makes sense because because I mean you know my 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 life was sort of circuitous. I was a you know I was uh, in the in the I was a painting contractor to put myself through school, and then I was I turned that into a, a speaking of of uh, frozen yogurt. I, I, I had one of the first frozen yogurt shops in 1981 and I, and, and that was successful. And then I pivoted and made a frozen yogurt shop slash uh, salad bar restaurant. And that was a massive undertaking and, and that lost, lost money. So I started over again and, you know, and I've, and, and um, my, my supplement business was a great business. And I, as I say, it was enough to support me for the rest of my life, but it wasn't until I realized I had the aha moment, like, dude, I'm writing about food every day on my, website and I'm talking and I'm and complaining that there's no real good sauces or dressings available. Why don't I go create some? Why don't I be the guy who does that? And uh, that only happened because I'd been writing so much about food and I'd been developing this theory. Like I never imagined when I was growing up that I was going to be the Mayo King of Malibu. Uh, you know, it was just never like a thought like one day I want to be, known for making mayonnaise. Um, and yet that's kind of how it, how it unfolded. And I'm thrilled and proud that it did. Mm. If you could only have one more food to eat for the rest of your life, what would you have? Lamb. Why lamb? I just love the taste of lamb. And you know, and I, like I would say, uh, you know, uh, cherry Garcia ice cream from Ben and Jerry's, but, uh, but I, but well, cause that's just, you know, that's, that's the height of decadence. <laughs> But, um, but pretty much if it was one that I knew was supposed to be, you know, let, let, was going to serve me well and be, be good for me and I was going to be willing to eat it if I was stranded on an island and I knew that, that, you know, that was the one thing that could sustain me, it would be lamb. Now, if you said two things and I could get away with it, I'd say peanuts and beer. Yes. <laughs> not necessarily the beer. I'll do the peanuts and then yeah. have peanuts with lamb. If that's yeah, yeah those yeah. would be my two. <laughs> yeah. But um, Mark, my final question to you, this is my my legacy question. I ask everyone at the end. You've been able to reach the age of one hundred, and your friends have decided to put together a highlight film of pretty much everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Then ask me how in the world they got it. We'll just call it magic. They've been able to get it. 
show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, he, I, I wanted to say he, he changed the way the world eats. Mm-hmm. That's been my mission. I like that legacy. It's a good one to leave. Primal. Yeah. <laughs> Eat yeah. more meat. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mark, thank you so much for your time for unboxing a little bit of your story and everything that your advice as well. Very appreciative. Where can people find you, learn more about you and connect with you? Sure. MarkStaleyApple.com is the blog and the site. That's really the best, the best place. Um, if you look up Primal Kitchen Foods, uh, on Instagram, we've got 600,000 followers on that there. And so, but, but if you want to, and, and then the book, you know, the primal blueprint or the keto reset diet, uh, or keto for life, uh, just Google Mark Sisson books and you'll come up with, with, uh, you know, 12 of the books that I've written. Thank recently. you so much. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, Mark, for coming on the Storybox podcast. Yeah. My pleasure. Jay.